Hello everyone, I'm Parker from 16458, the Technoizers, and I'm on the mechanical team. And I'm Justin, and I'm from the programming team. So in today's presentation, there's two main topics that we are planning on covering. And the first one being the importance of a proper brainstorming process, and secondly, followed by improving autonomous reliability through robot design, and as well as kind of how our robot this season was optimized through robot design for autonomous performance. So I will get into that later. So first of all, I think Justin can talk about this. Yeah, so first off, I'm just going to give a little brief introduction about our team. Uh, we're the Techno Wizards team 16458 in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we are an 11 member community team. We actually just got three uh, new members this year. We've had nine years in FIRST and five years in FTC. So a couple things that we achieved this year is that we were world, uh, world champ uh, semifinalists in the Ochoa division. We also came out as first Inspire Award winners uh, at the Central Texas Championships. We won first Design Award at the Texas State Championships, and also we had the first highest OPR in Texas uh, in qualifiers. Okay, so next I will actually start beginning our presentation, and I'm going to talk a little about the importance of brainstorming actually having a good brainstorming initial design process when we start a season. So. Before I get into actual our brainstorming design process for initial design, um, I'm going to talk a little about, about the importance about what we've learned this past season on kind of the importance of having a good brainstorming process. And there's two main points I want to cover. And the main one is this eliminates the need for later in the season for you need to rebuild your robot. So a lot of teams aren't capable of rebuilding a robot later in the season due to time, time constraints. And the main benefit of actually having a good brainstorming process at the start of the season is you're able to eliminate inefficiencies in your design. And this allows you to keep one single design that's good, efficient, and reliable throughout the entire season. And this can save time and allow you to iterate on specific parts of your robot that you want to improve later on the season. And it's also better if you just have a good initial design at the start because it allows you to perform well in competitions, obviously. Second of all, like I kind of, kind of already mentioned, it also allows you to iterate on specific parts of your robot that you want to change and modify and improve on. If you have a poorly initially designed robot, this means that your entire basis of design is kind of messed up and improving just one portion, one aspect of your robot may not be beneficial as much as complete redesigning, which I mentioned may take too long. So it's better if you have a good initial design process to leave you time later in the season to actually be able to modify specific parts. So now going into um, the initial design process that we personally used the last season, I have listed four main steps, but it's not really a step-by-step -step process. It's kind of a full emotion that we go through. And first and foremost, a little bit of common sense, like duh, but you need to read the game rules. You need to analyze them very intensively because you need to be able to know what your design constraints are. You can't just design anything and you need to know what is legal, what is illegal when you're designing a robot. So design constraints are very important. The second point in our design process is really the most important one and the one that we focus on the most last season, and we benefited most in Lauda 6 and C the most, was actually assigning values, which is completely new to us. And when I say assigning values, I'm talking about assigning importances and kind of creating a hierarchy of specific aspects of the game that you find most important. So just kind of an example of that last season, one thing that we really wanted to focus on and what shows a lot in our robot design was a Thomas performance. So we valued a Thomas performance extremely high because of how the fact that cones were counted twice and that parking was the same amount of points as completing a circuit. So we saw optimizing the autonomous aspect of our, of our robot to be extremely important. So when we designed a robot through initial design process, we wanted a robot that hit on every single aspect of autonomous in a reliable and efficient manner. After assigning these specific values, we go into team brainstorming. Oh my God, sorry. Okay, there you go, team brainstorming. And team brainstorming, it's just as it sounds, brainstorming as a team. Personally, we like using a whiteboard so we can display ideas out in an open manner to allow each of our team members to contribute ideas to each other. We will be also find using resources such as GM0, which is really great resource, which is written by FTC teams and it has countless documents and countless components that past teams have used on their robots and a great introduction to specific aspects you will learn more about designing a specific part if you want to design so. Um, also helps with coming up with ideas. We also found looking at um, past seasons and other team designs also really helped us design our robot. Um, a lot of robot has been, has been inspired by teams of past seasons and looking at what they did and what helped them succeed 
and trying to apply those same concepts in our team this year. And a lot of that contributed to um, our rubber design and overall our success. We really recommend teams looking at that. And then finally, and really important is design confirmation in which those designs that you came up with team brands. I mean, you actually try simulating these designs, you CAD them and you do design for visualization to make sure these designs are actually reasonable. You can actually accomplish them and they're within a time frame that would be reasonable for your team to actually build in time. So a lot of stuff that you do in team brainstorming, we like to do design confirmation, make sure that our designs that we come with are actually reasonable. And like I mentioned, we do that a lot through CAD and visualization. So next I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what we came up with through our design and um, brainstorming process this season when we designed a robot. And there were three main topics, like I mentioned in stage two of um, the design process, initial design brainstorming process, assigning values. These were the main values that we designed, that we assigned to a robot design this season. And these were um, optimizing design performance and reliability. We also wanted to very highly rank junction ownership and also um, reduce driver workload. We found that this season, because there are so many different spots where you can deliver and there's so many poles, there's so many junctions, you can deliver on the ground, you can deliver on ground junctions, you can deliver on different heights of poles. Um, we found that it would be very beneficial to reduce driver workload as much as possible. And that kind of showed in our robot design, which I can go a bit later. And then, so optimizing the design, design I'm sorry, optimizing autonomous performance. Um, main tips that we found when you're designing a robot in order to optimize design performance. Sorry, I'm moving on to the second topic of the presentation now. So the main things that we figured out from last season that allowed us to actually have a very well-designed robot for autonomous performance was prioritizing eliminating variables as much as possible. And when I say variables during autonomous, I'm talking mostly about localization errors. We found looking at past seasons and what caused a lot of teams to have a unreliable autonomous was from poor localization, whether it's be from biodometry tuning or other forms of localization, um, getting off on accuracy from driving caused a lot of um, unreliability during a lot of teams autonomous. So we find prioritizing, eliminating this kind of variable and what other variables such as climbing other robots to be as helpful, to be one of the most helpful things to help um, increase autonomous reliability. Secondly, what we try to do um, and what other teams should try to do is implement fail safes. And a lot of the fail safes we implemented this season was through sensors. And one example of that is kind of for intake. Our intake, um, we have a basic call like a lot of other teams have. And within our intake, we have a distance sensor. And during autonomous, one of the main things that we do is looking and seeing if we detect a cone. If we don't detect a cone within a certain amount of time, then um, our robot is able to assume that maybe the stack got knocked over Maybe our intake system stopped working and didn't extend all the way. And one of those different specific um, needs doesn't get met, then we know to stop running autonomous, stop delivering, and actually just go and park in order to enter autonomous early. And implementing a lot of those fail safes um, can help maintain a high autonomous reliability and help maintain scoring even with one part of your autonomous failing. And lastly, um, one thing that a lot of teams should focus on that we feel is optimizing it for a design that increases reliability instead of trying to create a design robot that does not focus on actual potential during autonomous. So one thing that last season, a lot of teams scouted for, it's much better in our opinion to scout and find a team that had an autonomous that could do a one plus three very reliably hundred percent of the time versus a robot that could do, let's say one plus five, but only work 50% of the time. Because although they have a higher scoring potential, the reliability is not, at a point where we'd be comfortable picking them and having a robot that's very reliable at a specific task. They're especially during Thomas is very valuable, um, not only to optimize your Thomas performance, but also in scouting and alliance selection. So next um, I'm gonna start the next portion of um, our presentation where we kind of talk a little bit about debriefing our robot and how we kind of specifically try to accomplish some of the tasks that I talked about earlier and optimizing design performance. So the main thing that we focused on this season or the main um, innovation that we kind of had this season that we focused on was having two turrets. And by two turrets, I basically mean having a turret on our intake system, but also having a turret on our delivery system. And what this allowed us to do is our robots remain stationary while cycling in Thomas. And if we swap to 
our camera. I can kind of showcase how the two turrets look visually. This is our intake system, and during autonomous, once we drive to the cone stack, which would be maybe right here, our intake would turn 90 degrees, such as, and then our auxiliary turret would be able to turn 45, and this allows us to do is a robot doesn't need to move it all while cycling. Our intake can extend out, and our delivery can extend out, and our robot doesn't need to rotate at all. And all it has to do is sit in one position, and this allows us to reduce a lot of localization as a lot of our teams may have had in the previous seasons. This also reduces um, chances of collision with other robots because we're trying to stay on our side of the field away from other teams. So that's the main point of our double turret system, and that showed a lot in our Thomas accuracy this season. So nextly, the next thing that we had and we brainstormed that we wanted to use to increase the Thomas reliability was through having both an intake and delivery extension. And this is much like our reason for having our double turret system. Having both an intake and delivery extension allowed a robot to remain stationary. So I guess I can showcase that again. Our intake extension um goes out such as and this allows us to grab cones from the cone stack we have a virtual four bar with a claw that's just able to grab the cones at different heights and deposit it back in our transfer system and using the intake extension prevents our need from the need of the robot to move horizontally or different motions and we also of course have our delivery extension which allows us to deliver to the pole at an angle and also at multiple heights because in some matches you may want to deliver to the medium junction or to a dodge opponent. So that's how we used um, two extensions to improve Thomas accuracy. The last and final most um, important part that we found that allowed us to improve Thomas accuracy this season was having a pull liner implemented. And I know a lot of other teams have this, but the way we did it, I guess was a little unique, which I can showcase. Um, one thing we wanted to focus on their pull liner was to have it um, be able to deploy without any servos. It's a free deploying pull liner. And the main reason we had that was to reduce weight on our delivery extension so we can have a faster extension time, but also reduces complexity so there's less um, actual servos and actuations that's happening. So the way it works is we just have it auto extend out. We have a bungee to pull it down so it's always extending to the same position. And what this basically allows us to do is just uh, vector the pull within our delivery claw. So we can deliver on the pole in the same position every single time. And this really just allows us to eliminate inaccuracies in fields. So we don't have to worry about maybe if this one field that we're playing on has a pole tilted this way and this other field has a pole tilted this way. We can eliminate those field inaccuracies with our pole liner. So that was the main point for that. And that pretty much concludes our presentation. If there are any questions, we would um, gladly be able to answer them. If not, um, thank you for having us on. A couple questions that we'll be asking uh, from the chat coming in. Uh, first off, from the Bakari uh, asking, How did you wire your double turret design? So, with our wiring, it was a little complicated. We did, um, if we swap to the camera, we did have problems at the beginning of the season with um, because our extension is so long. Um, on our intake system, we needed wires to run all the way from our expansion hubs all the way out to our cloud here because it flows all the way through. So we had initially just soldered wires together, which wasn't great because um, we had to compact this all in one location. And when the wires came together, we had to actually pull them in at the spots where we soldered the wires together it could cause them the connections to loosen. So we basically ended up just having to make our own custom cables and we soldered our own custom cables. So everything running from our control hubs, our expansion hub runs all the way through, and it's just one cable that we have running all the way through for each one. And specifically, um, you asked how we wire the double turret system. But then our robot, we have a bungee. And at the back, we kind of have a little bit of a, a mini turret where it's, it's kind of hard to showcase, but I can explain a little bit. We have a mini turret where all of our connections come out of. And this allows all our wires to free spin at the back of the robot so they don't become cramps or they don't just get crunched up. So when our intake spins, there's a rotation movement back here where all the wires can rotate. And they're all held together through a bungee. That's kind of how we do it. Chat, we'll uh, give a couple more minutes from questions if anybody else has any. We do have uh, one coming in uh, from uh, James Liu. 
uh, asking, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the uh, your transfer system? Asking specifically, how did you transfer the cones between the two slide systems? Yeah, so with our transfer system, it's pretty simple. Um, we have our just our basic intake claw. It's on a virtual core bar. We have our distance sensor, which allows us to automatically detect cones. And when this happens, the whole system is automated and we deliver. And right here, we have a funnel system. And with the funnel, a cone can be dropped in many different positions and they all kind of funnel back in the same spot. And it's just possible for liability issues that we had um, later on, earlier on in the season. And when they're all funneled in one spot, we have our second virtual forward which can come down and grab cones and we just deliver. So the four bar will just come down and grab it. Our, our four bar is kind of broken right now, so I can't show that. <laughs> It's been a long season. No worries on that at all. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, Techno Wizard, thank you so much for uh, telling us uh, more about your team. You're about congratulations on a great season. We look forward to seeing you uh, in center stage as well. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Thank you. Your destination for first content, updates, and gaming. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. Fun is continuing to grow and looking for new ad partners for the 2024 season. If your organization has a positive message to spread to our over 250,000 unique viewers, go to firstupdatesnow.com slash contact to get more information. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash firstupdatesnow, join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash firstupdatesnow, and check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.